Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. The outcome of Iran's presidential election last Friday is generally regarded as a surprise. Of the half dozen candidates, Hassan Rouhani was the least conservative. In the final days of campaigning, he got strong backing from the leading reformists. He won more than 52% of the vote and avoided an expected runoff. Now, the focus is on forward-looking questions that are even more difficult to predict. Will it be possible for Rouhani to introduce substantial reforms, or will he be under strong constraints from the supreme leader, Ali Hamani? Will Iran's foreign policy change? On our program today are three experts who have written extensively about Iran. Shaul Bakash is a history professor at George Mason University in the Washington, D.C. area. Arash Karami is the editor of Al Monitor's Iran Pulse. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you. Arash, how significant is uh, Rouhani's victory uh, for the reformist movement that was uh, stunted uh, by Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's two terms as president? Well, the fact that Rouhani did uh, receive a large portion of the support from the reformists uh, means something. Um, Mohammad Khatami, the reformist report, reformist president, he um, he has a strong social base, and he can get out people to vote. And Rouhani's victory uh, offers them an, a possibility, uh, a hope for some movement, for some action. Um, in the last eight years, especially the last four years, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, student groups, a lot of political parties have either been dissolved or they've been unable to operate. So if this provides some possibility for them to be able to operate, uh, be able to at least gather, this would actually be a huge improvement for what they mm -hmm. have now. It doesn't guarantee that they will have this, but it offers them the possibility. And um, obviously the situation of political prisoners is still an issue. And uh, particularly um, Mushavi, Chalubi, and Rahnala for um, protesting the 2009 elections are still under house arrest without charge. This is a major issue for mm -hmm. them. And, you know, Rouhani, he's really the only candidate out of the six final candidates um, to constantly condemn the security atmosphere of the country. And this resonated with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, it's doubtful that he's going to break the system. It's, well, it's not, he's not going to break the system, but it's doubtful he's going to even implement strong or uh, structural changes. But there is a possibility, even with the Supreme Leader's blessing, that he might open the doors a little bit mm -hmm. and allow for a little bit more movement and a little bit of a breathing room right. uh, for the reformers to operate. Okay, and uh, Shaul, in your article uh, in the Iran Primer, the headline is, uh, what Rouhani's victory means for Iran. So what, what, what are your main points? Well, I agree with Arash that um, uh, Rouhani's election does open the possibility of a uh, improved political environment and uh, more freedom of speech, press, and association. In addition to that, Rouhani has taken a much milder line uh, in terms of um, Iran's foreign policy and its negotiations with the United States and its allies over its uh, nuclear program. And he has spoken of uh, ending Iran's international isolation. And, and finally, um, the new president will have to address the um, economic wreckage that uh, eight years of Ahmadinejad's presidency has uh, mm -hmm. imposed on the economy. And speaking of uh, um, the, uh, the biggest issue facing Iran, at least from an outside perspective, is the West's concern that the ultimate aim of Iran's nuclear program is to build nuclear bombs rather than uh, just generate electricity. Um, and international sanctions have hobbled the Iranian economy. And in remarks in a few days after the election, uh, Rouhani said he's uh, quote, still prepared uh, to bring more transparency to Iran's nuclear program. Uh, so, Shaul and, and then Arash, uh, what do you make of the president's, uh, president-elect's uh, comments this week? This is Shaul. Shaul, um, yes. Rouhani does have a track record when he was Iran's 
chief nuclear negotiator in 2003 to 2005 of reaching compromise agreements with the Europeans and the and uh, uh, on the nuclear issue and he seems to believe that if he offers greater transparency and um, opens up Iran's nuclear program to more intensive inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency, he can satisfy um, the West's demands over Iran's nuclear issue. Now, whether the supreme leader will allow Iranian concessions before uh, the severe sanctions imposed mm -hmm. uh, by, by the West on um, Iran are lifted uh, is, is another question. We'll just have to wait and see. And uh, Arash, you um, uh, have, have written about you know the relationship between um, the uh, incoming presidents and the supreme leader. Can you tell us um, a bit about uh, this long uh, long term relationship? Uh, yeah, that relation actually goes back decades. Uh, um, in the beginning of the war, um, back then, uh, um, the president uh, Khamenei. Uh, he wasn't the, the, the supreme leader yet. He wasn't an Ayatollah yet. He put uh, Rouhani in charge of um, a certain branch of the army. He uh, has been the, uh, the supreme leader's representative in the National Security Council for a very long time. So uh, Rouhani is definitely an insider. He's had a good working relationship with um, uh, the supreme leader. And Rouhani himself, he's been very critical of uh, various reformist movements or protest. You know, he was uh, critical of the student protest in 1999. Uh, he was uh, critical of certain protests that took after the 2009 election. And these things, uh, they did endear him, and they did keep his relationship intact with the Supreme Leader. So definitely on uh, good relations. I would just say something on the, the negotiation. Right. Um, the fact that uh, uh, he, Rouhani ran on his ability to negotiate with the West and Europe, and the fact that he's able to broker a deal with them. Uh, he was attacked by hardliners, especially the current nuclear negotiator and a candidate, uh, Saeed Jalidi, who said, and uh, his uh, deputy, uh, Bahadi, who said that, you know, you gave up Iran's rights, and Rouhani actually took pride in this while he was being attacked by the hardliners. So the fact that he had such a strong relationship with the Supreme Leader, the fact that uh, it appears to some extent with uh, reliability that the Supreme Leader had a strong say directly within the Guardian Council that approved of Rouhani's candidacy. Um, it, it, there's a possibility that the Supreme Leader realizes the country's suffering, the, the sanctions are taking a toll, and he seems uh, possibly okay with allowing Rouhani to be the face of these negotiations and uh, trying to implement them, which is what the president would have a huge say in. So there appears that the Supreme Leader might be okay with it and might have given the green light to see what the opposing side, particularly Europe, would say. I don't well, expect a whole lot of uh, expectations with America yet. And, and let's, let's put some, per, some perspective on it. Shal, you've written about uh, Iran's uh, six presidents uh, and uh, it's, it seems to be a similar situation with what happened uh, after Hatami's election with the uh, uh, ho hopefulness. How does uh, Rani compare with the, the two that came before Ahmadinejad? Well, Ahmadinejad, the previous president, um, um, campaigned and was elected on a populist um, platform, and he claimed to to stand as the champion of the little man. And in fact, during his presidency, he did pursue populist policies very much like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, Khatami, um, the previous president, launched a program of very extensive political reforms and the country experienced, at least during the early years of his presidency, an unprecedented opening up of um, freedom of the press and political association. Um, he was uh, later blocked by a right-wing uh, backlash. I don't mm -hmm. think we will see with Rouhani anywhere near as extensive an attempt to open up the political space as we experienced with um, Khatami. Mm -hmm. Rouhani seems to be much more a man 
of modest um, incremental steps rather than uh, a uh, radical change in direction. Now, um, uh, Rouhani's, one of Rouhani's mentors, the, another previous president, um, Rafsanjani, mm -hmm. was a pragmatist, a man who tried to open up the economy to the private sector and to reduce the state's role in the economy. And I think, you know, in that in that uh, sense, uh, Rouhani too will prove a pragmatist. And he's already mm -hmm. talked in general terms. Um, of an attempt to steer the economy back to a more sensible, more moderate course, which um, I am sure he will try to do. Okay. okay. And um, what <clears throat> shall, if in general, I know that the uh, the economy and the uh, uh, nuclear issue were the two top uh, uh, issues that were raised during the campaign. But what about uh, foreign policy and the and, uh, the issue with uh, Syria's civil war. What are some other obstacles and, and policies that uh, um, that are facing Iran? Well, these others, in addition to the nuclear program, are very serious obstacles to an improvement of Iran's um, relations with the United States and uh, with Europe. As uh, I'm sure your listeners know, Iran mm -hmm. is a principal supporter of the Syrian president. Um, Assad uh, and uh, Iran surrogates the Hezbollah fighting forces in Lebanon have, are now involved in the uh, Syrian civil war. It's very unlikely that um, under Rouhani, uh, Iran's uh, position on Syria would change dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, it's become a pillar of Iran's foreign policy to be opposed to the very existence of the state of Israel. And I think, again, it would be very difficult for um, the, the new president, ha ha however he is personally inclined, to change that position. So um, um, there's not going to be a radical change in Iran's foreign policy positions on these issues, but th there is, as Arash stated a bit earlier, some hope that um, Rouhani will managed to soften Iran's position on the nuclear issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Arash, what are, what, what, what are your thoughts on the uh, foreign policy issues uh, well, besides one, the nuclear uh, issue? I completely agree. Uh, Syria is not going to change. Uh, Iran really sees uh, Syria as a part of this axis. Uh, you know, Iran and Syria relations uh, go deep. Syria was the only Arab country to support uh, Iran during the Iran-Iraq war when they had other uh, country, Arab countries in the Persian Gulf uh, and in the Middle East to support Saddam, whether it was through money or sending in soldiers. And so Iranian, uh, whether it's the foreign minister or other officials, they constantly talk about Syria support, even up until recently. They talk about Syria support for Iran during the Iran-Iraq war. And it would be a big embarrassment for Iran to let this go uh, or to turn their back on him, uh, just if they didn't have to. But also, they do believe that Syria as part of the resistance access to uh, Israel and through serious support of Hezbollah, this is a major uh, issue for them. Uh, they do want to be at the negotiating table. I know many uh, have opposed this, uh, but Iran feels that they, uh, they should be there. I, I doubt their position will ever change. But, well, those positions will seriously never change, and their position towards Israel is not going to change either. Um, Unless Iran really uh, is facing some kind of existential threat, these two positions will not change. Okay. <clears throat> and in some ways, does um, the election of a moderate, when Iran is going through such difficulty right now, take some of the pressure off uh, uh, Hamani, uh, uh, the, the, uh, that people have a little bit of hope now and, and uh, presumably won't uh, um, protest uh, Shaul? Well, already there, there does seem to be a, a change in the atmosphere and environment in Iran, and clearly an expression of, of hope for change, both in the direction of relieving some of the security pressure on society as a whole and on the young, and uh, improving the economic situation and improving Iran's relations with the 
international community. Um, to cite just one small example, Rouhani, during his election campaign, paid special attention to women's issues. He mm-hmm. promised to establish a ministry for women's affairs um, and also to reverse the restrictions on women's access to higher education uh, imposed by the out going government. So in all these spheres, I think we see the glimmers of hope in society as a whole um, for change. Uh, And uh, obviously this does relieve the pressure on the regime Mm -hmm. um, from popular discontent. But uh, again, you know, Rouhani will have to produce uh, results if he expects to retain um, public support and uh, these hopes that he has stirred in mm-hmm. uh, uh, the society as a whole. Right. I agree, and I think to add on the economy issue, um, the president does have a lot of uh, discretion in the implementation of uh, economic issues. Uh, one of our columnists, uh, columnists in our monitor had a very interesting article on uh, the subsidized housing projects that were implemented by Ahmadinejad and mm-hmm. uh, what kind of uh, catastrophe, overall catastrophe that was for the housing market inside Iran. And a lot of the erratic statements the president made on the housing industry also created a lot of confusion and was really damaging. And if uh, Rouhani can just bring a little bit of stability to even one uh, market within the economy, this would uh, vindicate Iranians' uh, vote for him. So there's one definitely a difference where Rouhani can be of influence. Okay. And now, I want to, before we continue our discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to our program on the website. There are interviews with another Iran expor- expert and with a reporter who got jailed while covering the demonstrations after the 2009 election. There's also a breakdown of power, uh, the, uh, an analysis of the breakdown of power, the presidents and the supreme leaders. Please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter at Global Jorn. And Shaul, the, uh, what's your feeling about uh, how these uh, sanctions have, have affected the economy and just the, kind of the 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 overall climate in 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 Iran as far as what the citizens are feeling. I'm trying to get a picture of of, of what it's like uh, uh, day to day life in Iran now and how it's changed. Well, well as Arash mentioned, uh, President President Ahmadinejad has pursued uh, policies at home which have been extraordinarily wasteful of um, very substantial oil revenues and which have fed inflation and economic um, uncertainty and instability. But in addition to that, the sanctions imposed on Iran by the U.S. and the Europeans have been uh, devastating. Mm -hmm. Iran's um, currency is now worth less than half of what it was worth um, against the U.S. dollar even a year ago. Mm Um, Iran's oil exports have been halved. Um, Iran's oil uh, foreign exchange reserves are way down. Um, the country is suffering from um, rapid inflation and high unemployment. And because of restrictions on the banking sector, um, Iranian banks have a great difficulty in conducting international transactions. And Iranian Industries have difficulty in importing raw materials and spare parts. Um, And therefore, while um, Rouhani may be able to correct some of um, Ahmadinejad's uh, mistakes in the economy internally, he will desperately need some relief um, uh, of these uh, foreign imposed sanctions on the economy if he's going to show uh, a substantial improvement mm-hmm. um, in the economic sphere. And Arash, can you also c- kind of uh, help us out with uh, um, uh, understanding what it's like uh, uh, living in, in Iran now compared with the uh, past? 
Well, you, you know, I just uh, what we saw um, talking to people, getting a, a taste of them, you know, uh, I, I was talking to someone who said uh, for the first time in a decade, uh, people are nice to each other. And, um, you know, for someone outside in uh, another place might not understand that, but the this economic uh, punishment has really taken a toll on society. Uh, mm-hmm. It really creates a lot of uh, social issues, uh, whether it's uh, crime, whether it's just um, an atmosphere of anger or frustration was really prevalent in the country. And the fact that uh, they, their vote, or the most moderate candidate was able to win, the fact that they uh, were recently qualified for the World Cup, uh, these kinds of things that created a euphoria and it created a, a lot of excitement. And just the fact that people are noticing that people are nice to each other, mm-hmm. or that people are noticing people are, are happy, uh, it's, it's significant. And it's a huge... Uh, has a, a lot of meaning. And now, uh, a friend was talking to someone in Iran, and he said something interesting. He said, hey, you know, I'm really uh, happy for you guys that Ro- uh, Rouhani won. And he said, listen, we didn't vote for Rohan. We mm-hmm. voted for hope. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's really what it's about. Um, that really, ca- For me, that really captured what Rohani represented for the people. It was really about a hope for something better. Okay. And the, uh, I wanted to... Uh, Talk about the media, and I know it's uh, you guys monitor uh, the media really closely in, in, in Iran uh, and the uh, social media as well. Uh, uh, Shaul, what are your thoughts on could there be any change with uh, uh, media freedoms in Iran under uh, the new president? Well, well, certainly Rouhani has spoken of, um, um, of a freer press um, in the last few years, um, restrictions on press freedom and academic freedom have Mm -hmm. greatly increased. The uh, security and intelligence organizations have greatly increased their clout. Large numbers of journalists have been put on trial Mm -hmm. and jailed. Um, But again, you know, Rouhani um, will face um, formidable obstacles in trying to uh, bring about a change here because the security agencies the um, Revolutionary Guards, who are very influential, the leader himself, um, and the hardliners in general will be, will be opposed to uh, opening up um, political space and freeing up the press. Again, you know, we will have to see you know, how much skill he shows in managing this difficult problem, how uh, successful he is in persuading um, the leader to allow um, a m- more more open environment for the for the press. Mm-hmm. Arash, what's a, you, what are you what are you seeing out there in the um, in the media? Any any indications of, of possible change or looseness? Uh, well, there could be. And that was a great point on academic freedom as well. Uh, you know, under Ahmadinejad, uh, an economist was arrested for criticizing economic policy. So uh, this is how tight the, the situation yeah. was. Uh, today, and I covered it in today's uh, blog post, and I'll monitor, uh, the president, uh, former president Khatam spoke to an association uh, at Tehran University, mm-hmm. and he told people um, that you have to be patient, and he told them uh, you can't have misplaced expectations. So if there is going to be change, there might be change once uh, Rouhani takes office in August. And we have to remember Rouhani's not uh, president yet. It's still how many jobs is in the office, mm-hmm. and even once Rouhani yeah. does get in there, we have to be very um, uh, cautiously, cautiously optimistic that any kind of change can be implemented. As of now, the, uh, we don't really see anything, but, you know, surprisingly, uh, Internet has been okay. They didn't shut down Internet as some had, I thought they might get in, restricted as, uh, as much as some might have thought. So there is uh, some element of allowing people to kind of move. But nothing uh, serious or nothing really uh, significant. We'll have to wait and see what um, what they do once Rouhani takes office. And also, we're, we're going to have to wait. I agree on the point of the revolutionary guy. Mm-hmm. The hardliners within the Islamic Republic, um, maybe some of the hardliners that fought in the Iran-Iraq war, who genuinely believe the, they, the country owes them uh, for sacrificing so much, they might come back out, and they might show a very strong reaction. They haven't done so yet, but... We have to wait to see what their response is and how long they can be kept quiet because um, 
we haven't heard the last of them yet. Mm-hmm. And uh, finally, a final question for both of you, uh, uh, Shaul. The first, the, the uh, Arash mentioned how he sees the the outcome of this election as a vote for for hope. Um, how do you personally feel? Are you are you optimistic, hopeful, or are you are you s- kind of still skeptical? Um, I think there is an opening, um, and therefore um, uh, uh, room for hope. Um, again, to repeat, a lot depends on the skills um, of the new president, how long he can sustain the support he achieved in the voting and in the election itself. Um, And finally, you know, the degree to which the economic hardships the country is facing, um, the conservatives and the leader will realize are a result of um, international sanctions and that therefore Iran has to find a, a, a way out by uh, moderating its foreign policy positions and uh, um, also allowing the new president room mm-hmm. um, to pursue the policies he articulated during the campaign. Okay. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. We've come to the end of this week's uh, edition of Global Journalist, produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute, and the Missouri School of Journalism. Joining us today were uh, Shaul Bakash um, and uh, Arash Karami. Global Journalist is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungakar is our executive producer. Mikkel Christensen was our lead producer, with help from Tyler McConnell. Free Press Watch is next. And join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Now, for our weekly rundown of major events affecting press freedom around the world, Free Press Watch. I'm Ali McIntyre. This week's news comes from Brazil, Greece, and an advocacy group. One Brazilian newspaper editor was gunned down in the Rio de Janeiro state. Police indicated that the murder may have been an attempt to silence the paper's, quote, combative reporting, according to a Sao Paulo newspaper. Brazil is considered the deadliest country in the Western Hemisphere for the media as of 2013, according to the International Press Institute. Ten journalists have been killed in Brazil since the start of 2012. In Greece, the government suddenly announced it was shutting down the state-funded broadcaster, ERT, and laying off its almost 3,000 employees. The government says the cuts are part of an overall reduction in public employment to meet austerity requirements, but private broadcasters around the country are retaliating. A Committee to Protect Journalists report says 55 journalists from 21 countries have fled their homes this year because of violence, threats, and possible imprisonment. The top countries creating refugee reporters are Iran and Somalia. CPJ helps to support these journalists, but many seeking asylum find it a challenge to secure visas, find comfort, or assimilate into a new society. For more information on these and other events affecting press freedom around the world, please visit our website at globaljournalists.org. Thank you for joining us this week. I'm Allie McIntyre.